Okay, so the, so the title of the uh, of my presentation is Adaptive Social Listening to Inform Effective Vaccine Public Engagement Strategies, which is a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> what, I, what I'm uh, to, to distill that into an easier to understand title, um, I'm going to be walking th uh, you through, uh, uh, like I said, a new cross sector initiative called the Vaccine Demand Observatory, the Vaccination Demand Observatory. But don't worry, this is not a presentation of a dashboard. I'm sure all of you are just like me and you're drowning in dashboards these days. It feels like every single university on the planet and every single consultant on the planet <laughs> has a brand new dashboard that's going uh, to be the solution to the world's misinformation problem. So that is not what, what this is today. Um, uh, this is an initiative that, that spans multiple countries. It's really about creating uh, structures and, and, inf and information infrastructure to uh, counter misinformation and disinformation over time. Um, uh, so a, about a lot more than more than dashboards, which uh, which I hope you'll see. Um, so what's the point of the vaccination demand observatory? There's so many efforts out there right now. What makes this effort different? Um, well, part of it is its, is its mission. Uh, the Vaccine Demand Observatory is, like I said, multi-stakeholder. So it's not owned by one university or one government organization or one quasi-governmental organization. It's organizations with particular expertise coming together and building something new that is uh, co-owned by everybody. Um, and all of it is white labeled transparent. Um, and its whole point is to identify, track and respond to vaccine hesitancy and, and misinformation. So how does that work? It, it will work by creating a global network of infodemiologists. Um, all of you are aware in uh, March to, uh, 2020, the WHO declared an infodemic and then shortly afterward uh, declared a new branch of public health. And that new branch of public health is called infodemiology. And now we uh, need infodemiologists uh, so uh, it's an exciting time for, for public health for a lot of reasons, but th that's one of them. So this network of infodemiologists uh, spread across the globe, supporting national immunization programs uh, through equitable social listening, partner coordination, and actively informing demand generation, misinformation management, vaccine hesitancy, and new vaccine introduction. That's a lot, but what that really means is plugging uh, this new unicorn public health practitioner into existing uh, government and community networks to help them manage this, this problem, this growing problem, this problem that's gonna be with us for a really long time of misinformation and, and disinformation. So getting public health into the game. So the, the three organizations that are, that are really spearheading this effort right now uh, are UNICEF, uh, uh, the organization that I lead uh, called PGP or the Public Good Projects and Yale's Institute for uh, Global Health. <clears throat> and our next speaker comes from uh, Yale and will give more information about a particular part of this, uh, of this observatory. UNICEF, uh, I'm sure that most of you know this, but just in case, UNICEF is, the org is really the organization in the world that has the most expertise in immunization programs. They have active immunization programs in over 100 countries they immunize uh, uh, over half of the world's children um, every year. Uh, but prior to the pandemic, uh, prior to COVAX and these, and these new initiatives, UNICEF actually purchased the majority of the world's vaccines. So they have really deep generational expertise in, in vaccine communications and immunization programs. And they have a headquarters in New York City, but 85% of their staff are actually based in country from, from those countries. Um, so uh, if you had to choose an organization to roll out a global system to address vaccine misinformation and hesitancy and demand, it would be UNICEF, they're the natural partner. Um, PGP, we're a public health nonprofit as Angus mentioned, uh, we run the United States largest uh, vaccine misinformation monitoring program. It's called Project Vector and uh, Angus can provide the, the, the link for you uh, or, or I can. <clears throat> that provides vetted users uh, an ability to go in and see what misinformation is circulating in a given moment to understand the context and then to, uh, to look through resources and strategic communications guidance on what to do about it. That system is used by about 500 health organizations 
uh, uh, including the US uh, government, agencies of the US government, and agencies of the Canadian uh, government. So that system, which is which has been pretty effective and, and was actually running before the pandemic, but then evolved quite a bit because of it, um, is being scaled and adapted and built out, uh, added to, uh, to create the vaccine demand observatory. And then Yale, of course, which is led by Dr. Sado Mayer, has uh, incredibly deep experience in vaccine communications, uh, behavior change theory, and in evaluating and monitoring and studying immunization programs and vaccine communications around the world. So there's three pillars to the Vaccine Demand Observatory. One is uh, social listening and analytics. Uh, two is the Vaccine Acceptance Interventions Lab, or VAIL. Uh, and then the third is this, uh, this concept uh, of building this new branch of public health, and how do we do that? the Field Infodemiologist Training Program. And I'm gonna go into a bit more detail about each one of these three pillars. <clears throat> so social listening, um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, social media uh, listening or social media monitoring. Social listening actually uh, uh, means a lot of different data across a society all coming together and analyzed in a structured way for a specific outcome. Uh, so social media monitoring is a uh, part of social media, uh, uh, is part of social listening, but um, they, they are actually distinct things. So uh, the reason I, I call that out is when I say social listening, sometimes people think I'm talking about uh, social media monitoring, but that's just a part of it. It's actually a lot more complicated than that. But um, what's the most exciting thing about the Vaccine Demand Observatory is that it starts in communities and then it goes out. So um, part of why I'm exhausted with, with dashboards right now, and I'm sure you all are too, is um, there is no single solution. There's no silver bullet to this global problem of, of misinformation. And one of the ways that we know that is there are always uh, huge limitations on, on a dashboard's ability to show you what is going on in different geographic regions and particularly regions um, at the national level and then even more particularly at the community level. So we're coming into this understanding that, knowing that already. And what we're trying to do here is combine um, different means of existing sources of data coming from communities and, and then uh, pair that with public media data being brought in by media monitoring systems, put it all together, um, starting with spending most of our time in communities and then building it out. So it goes from communities to countries and then to the global monitoring system rather than, rather than, rather than, the, rather than the other. So what do I mean when I say lots of sources of data? Um, you could think of it in this visualization on the right hand side of the screen, this, communi this communication ecosystem. So we are all familiar, I'm sure you like me have read a lot of studies on Twitter data or data coming from Facebook or data coming from YouTube. All of those are really, really important, but they leave gaps in our understanding. They leave gaps either because uh, uh, certain communities, certain regions um, don't have a very deep internet penetration. Um, perhaps uh, certain communities or demographic groups aren't heavy social media users, but then there are also other reasons. Um, not everything said on Twitter is representative of uh, every community, and not every Twitter user is representative of an average everyday person. In fact, if you are a uh, <laughs> A, a power user of, of Twitter, I would argue you're probably pretty different in a lot of really important ways um, from your average or everyday person. So there are so many limitations to each kind of data within, within social media. Although they're critically important to understand and keep track of, there are other areas of data that are just as important. And, and in fact, uh, I think could be effectively argued more important. And those other kinds of data are things like community surveys, uh, polling, um, hotlines, uh, market research, uh, peer-reviewed research, and then also a tr traditional media, which isn't really talked about all that much when you look at the new dashboards that are being released because of this infodemic. But think about things like print magazines, magazines you actually hold in your hand, newspapers you hold in your hand, radio, television broadcasts, particularly in low and middle income countries, uh, those things are not being fed into a public media monitoring uh, system yet. 
Uh, those are things an actual human being has to go buy and read with their own eyes. So there, there's, a, there's a lot of ways that this needs to be done better. And that's what we're talking about when we say social listening. All of this data needs to be structured, put together and analyzed in a way um, that makes sense. Um, and again, not up to some uh, global headquarters, uh, really going to a country office that's, in a, that's creating a feedback loop of that data. The insights that come from that data go back into the community. And then as a secondary goal, goes up to what this, uh, this, this global coordinating body. Uh, so uh, what do I mean when I say the field infodemiologist training program? Well, it's actually modeled uh, after, and I'm sure some of you noticed this right away, it, it's modeled after the US CDC's uh, field epidemiologist training program, the FETP, and this is the FITP. But the field epidemiologist training program has been around for a few decades. It's a highly successful program. It's run by US CDC, like I said, in partnership with ministries of health and other public health groups all around the world. I think it's right now active in about 80 countries. And, and why it is so successful is it takes um, highly qualified epidemiologists um, from countries around the world, gives them uh, the same training uh, that uh, epidemic intelligence service officers receive uh, domestically within the United States in CDC. And then those individuals stay in their home countries and become highly skilled even more highly skilled leaders in public health and really lead uh, often their country's uh, uh, rollout of other uh, epidemiologists. They help build epidemiology programs and guide epidemiological thinking and strategy in their home countries. Um, and they work on the job while they are in the training program. So they are given uh, financial incentives and they are given a lot of training over the course of, in CDC's case, often two years, although there are shorter versions as well. So they're learning on the job, they're getting access to the world's best thinkers, um, and they're coming out the other end of it, a highly, highly skilled uh, epidemiologist. And that's what we're talking about doing here with infodemiology. And so here, here is the, uh, the, our proposed curriculum for this, uh, this field at infodemiologist training program. Uh, it's a year program broken into three month modules and, uh, and really modeled after CDC's effective curriculum for its epidemiologists, starting with public health surveillance, focused on misinformation and disinformation. How do you do it? How do these systems work? What's the math behind it? What's the science? Field investigations, um, this, this is in-country misinformation investigation and response. So if you see a spike in, in misinformation, this individual is, is providing technical assistance and strategic guidance to community organizations and partners where they live. Uh, planned studies, Yale comes into this, uh, plays a really big role here. So for example, randomized controls, tr controlled trials is what we're doing working, comparing it to other countries, other regions. And then scientific communication. How do you use the, the best evidence, the best new, uh, new science uh, that we have around vaccine communications, combating uh, uh, misinformation and disinformation, and roll that out practically in the real world on the job, doing the work of, of public health? And then this individual, this, this fellow, uh, would come from uh, wherever they were coming from. So uh, UNICEF has offered that they can be housed in the uh, in-country office. Uh, in, the, in the UNICEF country office, but they could be housed wherever they are. They might be a member of a government agency. They might be a member of a non-governmental organization. Uh, that is secondary. It, secondary, it really doesn't matter. What we're focused on is uh, what is what is the um, the credibility uh, of this individual and their ability to add to the to the field. Um, and I should mention how we're thinking about it is these are not necessarily epidemiologists that are being trained as infodemiologists. These are uh, people for, who perhaps come from a communications background uh, or a political science background, uh, cultural anthropology, uh, community development, community organizing. Um, as you can see here in the, in the curriculum, the, you really have to be a unicorn. And that's what WHO uh, no coincidence, is calling uh, info, infodemiologists as well. It's, it's creating unicorns. So some people will come from public health, some people will come from other fields, um, and there will always be something that is new that they will need to learn from wherever they are coming from. But at the end of the program, they all end up uh, with the same base level of, of knowledge and understanding and ability to do, to do the job. 
and we're in addition to building it out from um, from what CDC says uh, is a good curriculum. We're also building it out uh, from what WHO uh, says is a, is a good curriculum. And you can see here, this is kind of WHO's current thinking around uh, training infodemiologists. But I should mention, there's no agreed upon curriculum. There's there's no agreed upon certification uh, that, that's internationally recognized. There are no uh, degree programs yet in infodemiology, but they are coming. Uh, and so we are trying to get ahead of this and help form the thinking here. Um, and, we, and we're already behind. As we all know, we're in the middle of the infodemic. It's not getting better, it's getting worse. So we need, we need people in communities right now doing the job. We don't have the luxury of thinking about this and, and, and getting it perfect. We can't let perfect be the enemy of, of good. Um, so uh, WHO recommends blended active learning, um, uh, introductory modules on becoming an infodemiologist, establishing a, commu a community of practice so that uh, th these new fellows can learn from one another and share out to the field in general. That's very much a part of what we're planning. And then of course, a multitude of, of toolkits as is extremely common in, in public health programs. And how we're uh, imagining the, the structure of this working is, yes, there will be a, a vaccine demand observatory, a vaccination demand observatory headquarters that will be providing administrative support um, for this, uh, the FITP, the Field Infodemiologist Training Program. It will also have within it a vaccine acceptance interventions uh, lab, which, which um, our great speaker from Yale is going to be talking about in just a minute, um, and then a creative studio just to help with the production of the messaging. Uh, when it comes down to it, this is about communications. This is all about communications and media. Um, and, and many countries, many offices don't have creative studios uh, within them. And so uh, we, we know we're going into this knowing that support is going to need to be provided. Um, and so all of this technical assistance and training and capacity building and data sharing is going to regional offices and then and then country offices. And, and like I said in the beginning, that's really where that's really what it, the whole point. Uh, it's, it's for country offices. So uh, these regional and, and country offices are actually the ones primarily responsible uh, for uh, monitoring misinformation using the tools provided uh, by the observatory um, and making the real day-to-day uh, -day intervention decisions uh, and message deployment. So that's not coming from some you know, a grand uh, headquarters based in New, uh, in New York City or, or, or London or Rome. It's coming from uh, the person in the community on the ground who knows the country better than anybody else. Uh, so they're, they're in charge of uh, uh, all elements of that um, and then supported uh, again by this, uh, this, national, this international coordinating body that's assisting with managing the program, uh, providing uh, creative support, uh, and again, and again, the lab telling them what's working and, and what isn't working uh, from a from a scientific perspective. Um, so centralized functions, and then these uh, infodemic managers, uh, really uh, the boots on the ground doing the shoe leather infodemiology. So again, I won't steal the thunder of our of our next speaker because um, she's got some fascinating things to to, to say about uh, how we're imagining this lab and what this lab is is actually already done. Um, but just for a little bit of information, how we're imagining this workflow uh, working is a country infodemic manager. So this is someone who is doing who is a fellow in the uh, field uh, infodemiology training program. Uh, uses the systems, sees a spike in misinformation or disinformation. Um, they alert the lab. Um, the lab provides strategic communications uh, guidance support uh, and communications uh, templates. Those templates have been A-B tested in real time so that they have a sense of what works and what doesn't work within that country's context. Again, in a supporting role to the, to the infodemic manager. Um, that information, that guidance, the, those templates, uh, and the data itself is provided um, by the infodemic manager to the UNICEF country office, in addition to its national partners, uh, um, its community-based organization, uh, its network of community-based organizations, and then, of course, last uh, and least, global partners. Um, and all of this is measured and evaluated on a rolling basis uh, by, with randomized controlled trials that are managed by, uh, by Yale's team as well. So what have we done uh, to date? This is not just an idea on paper. This is an idea that's already uh, being actively piloted in a, in a number of countries. 
Um, we have, uh, as a team, given a number of webinars already. You can see some of them there on this slide. The webinars have been very well attended. Um, and, if, uh, and if the reception is, is any indication of the general interest within public health um, and the world of immunization and, and vaccines, the interest is very, very high. And, and I think um, there's widespread recognition that we need to do some things different and that we, uh, uh, and, and there seems to be a lot of receptivity to, uh, to new ideas. And, uh, and, and I think in particular, people seem to understand um, now after this last year of, of, of this pandemic, um, that if you don't integrate into communities, things really are not going to get better. Um, we created the uh, world's first <laughs> uh, vaccine misinformation management field guide. This guide uh, is available in multiple language, uh, languages. Uh, it was just released in Arabic a couple days ago. Um, it has about 5,000 uh, downloads, which for a public health manual is really great. <laughs> um, and uh, our, our first speaker and uh, myself and our last speaker and, uh, and Angus, our uh, MC for today, um, all of them had a, a really pivotal role in, in creating this guide. Um, and it will be iterated upon as we, as we learn more. Um, this field is evolving so quickly, um, you can expect the guide to evolve along with it. But you can see here on the left, there's, it's in two parts and then there's an, uh, uh, an operational framework. Um, and, and what we're seeing is already, there are individuals and organizations who are using this guide to build out capacity for, for their organizations. So it's a, it's a really exciting time and we're learning a lot. Um, and then we're already supporting uh, four countries in West Africa, Liberia, Congo, Brazzaville, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, there are, <clears throat> excuse me, in-country UNICEF teams with uh, partner organizations in communities already getting support from the vaccination demand observatory in the form of data sharing, technical assistance um, in the form of uh, communications templates, best evidence, best practice, and it is a very much a feedback loop. So uh, for example, if any communications are created, they are asked for uh, by the in-country team and they are iterated upon and, and edited and revised by the in-country team before they, before they go out the door. Um, and they also are not branded uh, you know, as, as the vaccination demand observatory. Uh, they are um, white labeled uh, pieces of content, white labeled, uh, white -labeled data, uh, and it's and that's because it needs to be able to be used by whoever needs to use it, and they don't need to, uh, they shouldn't feel burdened to provide attribution or or to cite uh, where it came from, because these people are already uh, doing a very hard job. They're doing the work of public health in addition to the work usually of managing uh, this pandemic and all of the, all of the immunization programs that uh, that are that are ongoing. Um, so don't make people work hard uh, to, to use the help you're trying to give them. That's really our core principle. Make it as easy as possible for somebody. Um, and yes, uh, there is a dashboard. <laughs> of course there's a dashboard. Um, so if you go to uh, the vaccinationdemandobservatory.org, you can see um, the, the URL there in the top left corner, vaccinationdemandobservatory.org. Um, you can ask for uh, access to the system. Uh, just like our uh, program in the United States, we vet the users, but uh, users are really anyone who works in public health or a health system or health organization, uh, a researcher um, or a health journalist. Um, we just are, are cautious about opening it up uh, for, for example, anyone in, in the public. Um, and that's because we're learning as we're going and, we're, and, and really we need to protect the community of practice. But for anyone on this call today would be, would be granted access. If you click into the dashboard, this is what it looks like. This, this, is, uh, uh, this screenshot was uh, taken last night. Um, so the next update is going to be this Friday. Um, and really what it, what it shows at the moment is misinformation and disinformation that's circulating around the world. And it comes with alerts. It comes with additional context. Uh, what is this? What does it mean? What do you do about it? Um, as well as a, a color-coded system for do you just monitor this and pay attention, or or uh, do you do we do we advise that you actually get ahead of it and directly inform the public? Should it affect your programming right now? Um, and th and that is a science in and of itself, and, and we use the framework that is in the uh, the misinformation management guide, um, which which is a nice little complete the circle moment. Um, we have dashboards for uh, global uh, as well as uh, different uh, global regions that you can see here in the drop-down menu. 
These are uh, live interactive dashboards that allow you to click around in the data, see what's happening. The limitation is uh, it's not all data. A lot of that offline uh, data that, I, uh, that I, I said was so important in the beginning of my talk has not been integrated into the system yet. This is a, this is a beta. We are out there looking for funding right now at the moment and additional partners, and we feel optimistic, but it isn't built into, this, into the system yet. So the, the, the limitation is this is publicly available media data that we can collect through numerous systems and then visualize. Um, so uh, much better than nothing. Uh, I think better than a lot of dashboards that are out there at, at the moment, but, but we're not satisfied. We want it to be a lot more robust, a lot more, a lot more rigorous, a lot more ability to triangulate a, a lot of different kinds of, of data. Um, uh, were you to click into one of those dashboards, this is what you would see. So another limitation, English language only at the moment, um, but we are uh, very focused on uh, rolling this out in as many languages as the misinformation uh, management field guide. Uh, is provided in, which I believe at the moment is about six. Um, but if were you to go into the dashboard right now, this is what you would see. Um, and th this number, the potential impressions uh, number is, is, is an important one to be aware of. 51 billion potential impressions in less than a 24 hour period right now on uh, information related to vaccines circulating through different kinds of media. Just, just a, a, a massive scale that, that would be too big for a, an entire university to be ever able to process. So these systems need to be able to accommodate just extremely large uh, data sets, uh, the definition of, of big data, and then spit out at the other end of it insights. And you can't do that without real human beings who are trained in infodemiology. Um, and there is no point to doing that unless those insights are going into communities where, uh, where public health is actually happening. So I'll go ahead and stop there. Please, Joe. Very, very interesting. So I'm wondering, you've been implementing uh, a similar approach across the US um, in local public health. I think you're giving access to local public health departments to a monitoring system. Are there any, um, I mean, I imagine that those departments are very, very busy, right? <laughs> are there any any interesting lessons that you've, you've um, uh, garnered in the last year in terms of uh, how this very concretely, you know, rolls out <laughs> in the field uh, in a pandemic? There's been a lot of lessons. So the US version of this was actually up and running before the pandemic hit. It was created in, in 2019. And so, uh, you know, it's hard enough to remember what happened last week, and it still feels like it's 2020. But if you can hearken back to uh, the before times of, of 2019, um, uh, no, very, very few people were interested in vaccine hesitancy. Uh, um, uh, um, and they were a smaller number that, that was interested in misinformation, but that was a pretty small number. Um, and then when the, when the pandemic hit and WHO started talking about uh, misinformation, the interest surged. Uh, and so the, that system has evolved a lot uh, since, since 2019. And we've learned a lot. We, we talk a lot to the users. Um, uh, there's no, a system isn't worth anything if the local public health person is not using it, isn't getting value from it. It might look really pretty and it might have a lot of really great data visualizations, but at the end of the day, if the, if the field infodemiologist in a city isn't getting any value from it, what's the point of doing it? Um, so one of the things that, that we learned uh, pretty early on was whether you are in uh, Liberia or whether you are in Santa Barbara, California, um, you don't have any time. Uh, if you work in public health, you've, you've got 10 jobs and this is just one of them. Um, and so we've designed all of these systems so that if you have five minutes or less, um, can you very quickly understand what's going on and be given guidance on what to do about it? Um, and it's funny because we were really naive in the beginning. We, um, ha having built some of these systems before um, and having personally having a background in data science, I think I had a skewed perspective on this. And so the first version of these systems allowed for a lot of going into the data and manipulating uh, the data. Um, and uh, and uh, very few people are actually interested in doing that. <laughs> um, people just want 
what do I need to do right now? And because I'm walking into a meeting, I just need to know what to do. Um, and it's, it's funny, we have interactive dashboards, um, but the, uh, we allow health journalists, health reporters uh, access to the system as well. And, uh, and actually they are the ones who go into and explore the data more than public health people. And it's because they're looking for stories. Uh, so they're trying to track misinformation to its source and, and, and write these, these news articles. And, and public health people just want to go straight to the point. Um, so it, it's important to include both, of course. Um, but I, I would say that's one of the big learnings. And then I would also say early on, um, we're all here today because we're fascinated by the science uh, around it, like uh, inoculation theory, fascinating. I want to know so much more about that and read every book uh, about it. Um, but I, I am not representative of, of your average public health uh, practitioner. And so um, what, we've, what we found uh, be, is necessary is providing a resource library where all of that information exists. And, and if an individual wants to, they can go. But to not burden the end user by, by um, attempting to educate them uh, too much while they're trying to do their jobs, give them just enough to do their job. Um, so that, that's been a learning too. Um, uh, and, and then I would say maybe the third and final lesson has been um, that whether we like it or not, politics are part of this. And, and I think a lot of us in public health were really naive also to believe that the pandemic and public health protocols weren't going to be uh, uh, in the political sphere, it, it, that, that we could just do the work of public health and it wouldn't be politicized. And what we've seen is what policy, what policies roll out and what politicians uh, do and say related to public health uh, is intimately involved with uh, misinformation and, and disinformation and, and what the public sees and what they believe and understand. Uh, and, and so certainly in the United States under the Trump administration, we saw what, what happened uh, uh, there, as did all of you. Um, and so we've had to reconcile Sometimes we don't want to talk about politics or we want to pretend that it's not part of what we're, what we're doing, but it is, it's very much part, part of what we're doing. Um, so that's been a learning too. And that, folks, please, if you're, um, it's much easier if you can put your questions in the Q&A. Um, I'll, I've seen there are a few turned up in the chat. Maybe one more question, Joe. We'll have a, we'll have a <clears throat> time to talk amongst the panel uh, at the end, um, but, so the WHO has held, uh, they held an infodemiologist training program last year and they're about to hold a second one. Uh, Robert Boy says, asks, you know, who is, who, who, is, who are these infodemiologists? Mm. Are they epidemiologists? Um, are they vaccine experts? Um, who do we imagine those people to be? Oh, for, for the fellowship, for the, for the, yeah. for this, for our version. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think, uh, I think it was WHO who used the term first, but the, the term that, uh, these are unicorns. Um, uh, and, and it's not only a new field of public health, uh, it's, it's a, it's a new field of communications and it's a new field uh, of production and, and, and uh, being a creative and a new field of data science. Um, so I don't think that I I, I, I think it would be a mistake if we limited it, limited it to um, epidemiologists, uh, for, for for example. I think it's more about um, acknowledging what it's it's uh, identifying fields that are well placed to um, to assist uh, that, that bring good expertise, um, and then looking at the uh, the caliber of, of the uh, candidate. Um, but but if if I was in charge. I would, I would be very happily give a fellowship to someone who was from a communications background uh, in, in addition to someone who, who was an epidemiologist uh, or for example, a, a data scientist um, or even someone who, uh, who had a deep expertise in community uh, uh, organizing or, or community health, really like boots on the ground, uh, you know, shoe leather work. Um, I think we're going to need a diverse group uh, of, of individuals, and, and I think the, the training uh, curriculum should reflect that, uh, uh, so that everybody kind of at the end of it ends up with the same baseline level of understanding, and elements of it are going to be um, redundant for, for, for people, but all of it together will be new for everyone. Uh, yeah. that, that, that would be my view. Yeah, and, and I mean, I was... Um... 
you know, we were we were pa partially involved in the in the WHO, so the infodemic team at the WHO um, infodemiologist training last year, and I think we saw a very diverse range of mm -hmm. of people selected for it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, for those of you on the on the call today, there's um, a second training coming up soon, so you might want to keep your eyes open for that. Um, certainly, the feedback from the attendees was was really really positive, and I guess. I guess the difference is um, what you're proposing here is kind of like the the um, the masters, right? It's the it's the it's the next level training where they're actually being you know in the field and and getting ongoing mentoring, support, and training while working in the field. So I think there's a nice complementarity there. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah. 